Amen. 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 Yes. This past Friday evening, we came as a church to observe the Good Friday, which, of course, was to be reminded of the tremendous price that the Lord paid for our sins. And we observed on video of segments of what Mel Gibson portrayed through the movie of the Passion. And through those several segments that we looked at, we immediately began to recognize the wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ, the wounds that he experienced, the wounds that he endured, the wounds that was expressed there on the cross of Calvary. Today, I want to talk about those wounds and I want us to see how those wounds is a reminder to us today of the price that was paid for our sins. But there was one thing about that movie that we did not really go in detail about. It did not show, of course, the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, but showed the resurrection. I heard about a Sunday school teacher uh, of a bunch of four-year-olds. And uh, she was asking them questions. And she said, uh, it was Easter, and she said, do any of you remember what last Sunday was? One little four-year-old little girl uh, spoke up and says, oh, yes, that was Palm Sunday. She said, well, that's wonderful. She said, well, do you know what today is? And she said, today is Easter. And she said, the teacher was speaking to this little girl. She said, well, what does Easter, what does that mean? She said, oh, that's when Jesus rose from the grave. And before the teacher could uh, congratulate the little girl, the little girl went on to say, and yet if he does not see his shadow in six weeks, he's going to have to go back into the grave. <laughs> well, we know that he didn't have to go back into the grave. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything hinges and falls upon that foundation. If there was no resurrection... We might as well cut out the lights and go home. If there was no resurrection, we might as well take our Bibles and close them and never open them up again. If there was no resurrection, what could we say of comfort when a loved one passes away? Everything falls and hinges and stands upon the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to look as what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said these words, listen to this. He says that if Christ be not raised, then our preaching is in vain. No need for me to stand up here. No need for me to take your time for the next 30, 35, 40 minutes. He goes on to say, he says, your faith is then and is, is in vain. And we're still in our sins. But oh, I'm so grateful and so thankful that there is a resurrection. And that Jesus is alive. Right. And he came forth with the keys of victory over everything that threatens us, death, hell, and the grave. And he comes and he relinquishes those keys to every believer that trusts him, Lord and Savior. 
I find it interesting as you study the scriptures that Jesus made several appearances after the resurrection. And on two different occasions, if not more, he spoke about the wounds that he experienced. And there he was, a resurrected body, displaying those wounds. I mean, you would thought that that glorified body, that all those wounds would have vanished away. But why did he still displayed those wounds. We're going to look at that today. I have three reasons why the wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ was displayed at the resurrection and even being displayed at the right hand of the Father today. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Of course, this is the resurrected chapter. But I want us to look at this one particular occasion when Jesus was talking with a couple of his disciples after his resurrected. They did not know who he was at the time. And I want you to notice of how he mentions his wounds. There in verse 36, we're going to read through verse 40. Would you stand with me in reverence of reading God's word? Notice what the Bible says in Luke 24, verse 36. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. Well, you can imagine. I mean, you stop and you think. They had watched him die. They watched him be buried in a grave and a tomb with a rock rolled in front, Roman soldiers standing on the outside, guarding and protecting that tomb. And all of a sudden, they see Jesus. And they were afraid. Who wouldn't have been afraid? But look what else they said. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, listen to this, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And then he says something rather unusual. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Why did he show them his hands and his feet? He's showing them his wounds. I'm the one that was upon that cross. I would, am the one that experienced the nailing of those spikes into the hands. See, feel it. Handle me. Jesus says, look at my side. Where that Roman soldier had taken that spear and thrust it into the side. There is that wound. Look at my brow. Where they taken those thorns and jammed it upon my head. Feel me, touch me, Jesus said. And the Bible says, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have any of you have any food here? (laughs) So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate it in their presence. (laughs) Now, you can't tell me a dead man can eat fish. (laughs) Here is a man that is alive and well. And he has what he thought was important at the moment to eat. Father, what a joy to read scriptures like this, to begin to discover of how Jesus expressed himself to his disciples and to others upon his resurrection. How he showed him Self, the wounds that he endured. Oh, Father, help us today to get a glimpse of the price and the wounds of our Lord and Savior today. Help us, dear Lord, to have just a little bit better understanding about the glorious resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, our prayer is today, if there is one that have never, ever trusted and believed in him, that they will confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that God had raised him from the dead. And the Bible says, and they shall be saved. That is our prayer. May the filling and the anointing of the Spirit of the living God be upon us as we preach and listen. And may Christ be glorified. That is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The wounds of Calvary. I want to talk about that for a few moments. I want to talk about why did Christ, when he arose from the grave, still display those wounds that man exposed upon the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, after all, he's risen from the grave. He should have a glorified body with no blemish, no spot, No, nothing whatsoever of the markings of this world. But yet, Jesus said, feel me, touch me, look, and see my wounds. I believe there's three reasons why he did that. First of all, I believe it's because he was saying to the disciples, And to you and I today, hey, the suffering has ended. I have paid the price. I've paid it in full. Chapter 24 is a remarkable chapter. And the Lord has been walking along with two of his disciples. And the Bible says they had not recognized him. And in verse 26, the Bible says, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory, his glory, his passion? Now, it seemed to me that what Christ is saying by displaying those wounds that my suffering has ended. I have paid the full price of the sins. When I look at those wounds upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we saw it displayed the other night in the film of the Passion, it 
Help me to understand the high cost of sin, the terrible penalty of sin, and that it was portrayed physically upon the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible reminds us that he had those wounds. And if you would have a medical examiner to come and to examine his body, the medical examiner would tell you that he had at least five different types of wounds. The first, of course, was the wound of contusion. Contusion, meaning that the body has been hit with some type of blunt piece of element that with force upon the body. And so... We know that the Lord Jesus Christ endured the fist of the Roman soldiers as they punched and beat his face and bruised his face to the point that he was almost unrecognizable. So he would say, there is the wound of contusion. And then, of course, there is the wound of penetration. In other words, as he would look upon the brow of the Lord Jesus Christ, he would begin to notice that there was something that was some type of pointed instrument that was thrust upon the brow, the head of that body. And, of course, he is speaking of the crown of thorns that was thrust upon the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how much pain that must have been as that wound of penetration? And then thirdly, there was the wound of laceration. The wound of laceration was brought about by on the back of the scourging of the Lord Jesus Christ. Taking a cat of nine tails with bone and pieces of clay at the end of those cat of nine tails and as they would swing that whip in the air and clearly claw into the back of the Lord Jesus Christ. That point of laceration. And then fourthly, there was the wound of perforation. And this, of course, was the piercing of his hands of where they had taken those nails, those spikes, drove it into his hands, drove it into his ankles. And then fifthly, there was the wound of incision, where there was some sharp-edged instrument, like a spear, thrust into the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a medical examiner would conclude with his report by saying, this was so horrible that who could ever endure the pain? Like a massacre. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ experienced five major wounds into his body. And so I have said that those wounds indicate that these sufferings are over. But yet when I read the Bible, I I begin to 
reconsidered that thought. That the Lord Jesus Christ still <coughs> experiences sufferings. It's almost sounding like I'm contradicting myself. But yet the Bible says that he has the feelings of our infirmities. In other words, when we hurt, he hurts. In other words, when we suffer, he suffers. When we're in pain, he is in pain. I remember that one time that when Jesus spoke to old Saul on the road of Damascus, and he said these words, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, of course, what he was talking about, Jesus was talking about the persecution of the Christians. And the Lord was saying, when you persecute them, you're persecuting me. The pain that they suffer is the pain that I suffer. Some of you are going through some kinds of pain. Maybe it be physical pain. Maybe it may be uh, pain of loneliness. Maybe it's a pain of facing the reality of death because of disease. I'm here to say to you today that because of the wounds of the Lord Jesus Christ, he still suffers with you. And he recognizes and experiences the infirmities that we have. I'm reminded of a, a dear, dear young man. He was my youth pastor at another church. He had just come on staff. He had just graduated from Clemson University. His name was Matt Locke. And he had not been with me but just a matter of months until he discovered he had terminal cancer. I watched that young man in the midst of all of his sufferings and in the midst of all of his pain glorified the Lord through the testimony that Jesus Christ was his Lord and Savior. And I'll never forget the day that he died. A young man at the age of 27 throwing his hands up in the bed and says, Jesus, it's over. And he died. Oh, my friend, I'm here to tell you, Jesus understands and he is burdened when we are burdened and he suffers when we suffer but oh friend I'm here to tell you because of the wounds that there's going to come a day when you can say it is over and that today I will inherit a new body that will never suffer again. But there's a second thing I want you to notice. Not only because of the suffering that is ended, but I want you to notice the stripes that was exposed that reminds me that the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ has come to an end. The mark of the wounds are the evidences of that Jesus Christ really did live and he really did die. He really did die on a cross. And not only did he really die upon a cross, but he was ter- buried and he really did rise from the grave. When I think about that, I think about there are two aspects that I want to share with you. First of all, there is a spiritual 
aspect to his concerning his body. See, the wounds were evidence of the reality of the crucifixion. That this was not a spirit. It was not some person impersonating the Lord Jesus Christ. But through the wounds, they were giving evidence of who he was. The Bible tells us in verse 36 that all of a sudden Jesus stood in the midst of those young disciples. And it scared them. You can imagine. You knew someone, you've been with someone for three and a half years or longer. You watched him die, you watched him be buried, and then all of a sudden, a couple of days later, he's there in your midst. Who would not be scared? But the Bible talks about that these disciples were very slow to believe. Very slow to believe. Because what had happened, they had moved into the realm of the supernatural. Now, they had witnessed many miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we have talked about for the past number of weeks. And they had seen Jesus do all kinds of miracles, even raise people from the dead. But now, this is different. They're involved. And now they're seeing that one Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 39, Behold my hands, my feet, that it is I myself, handle me. In other words, take these wounds and touch them and see for yourself. They always say seeing is believing. So see and believe. And it seems that as they came closer and closer and closer to this supernatural realm, the more they were convinced. And then, of course, there on that day on the Mount of Olives that when Jesus was ascended up into the sky, back into the glories of heaven, he ascended with those wounds. He still had the wounds in his hands. He still had the wounds in his feet. He still had the gash in his side. He still had the marks upon his brow. But oh, friend, because he ascended and because he arose from the grave, one of these days, these old bodies that you and I have today, that which is decaying every day, you're going to have a new body. And all those things will pass away. You can put these things away. (laughs) You can put those walkers away. You can put those hearing aids away. All those things that helps us As we get older, we begin to see more and more and more and more how these old bodies just decay right before our very eyes. All because he arose from the grave. And one of these days, we're going to arise from that grave. The dead in Christ, the Bible says, shall rise first. 
to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. And as those bodies come up out of that grave, they will be transformed into a new body in the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. But I want you to see not only a, the spiritual aspect of this matter, but I want you to also see the material aspect of this matter of the resurrected body. See, Jesus said, do you have anything to eat? Now, I think Jesus kind of chuckled when he asked that. He had watched them around the campfire. He had watched them frying the fish. And there was some honeycomb. And so Jesus asked, I want to show you something. I want to show you something. That this body, this body that is with wounds, this body that has rose from the grave, I'm going to eat, and I'm going to eat with you. And then he says something that as John was there that I thought was so interesting that he later addresses, he says, handle me. Oh, don't just believe what I'm saying. Touch me. Handle me. John couldn't get away from that. And when John got ready to write his First epistle of First John. Listen to the words he says in chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. <laughs> our hands have handled touched him, you can perceive me physically by touching me. These are the evidences that the Lord will say that I truly am the Lord Jesus Christ. I truly am the one that was upon that cross. And the disciples became so convinced that they were willing to die on that behalf. In fact, everyone on except John on the Isle of Patmos died a martyr's death because of what they had seen, what they had touched, and what they had experienced on that very day. You could not change their minds. You could not change their hearts because of what they had experienced. And they were, I noticed that they were 10 disciples. Two of them were missing. Of course, Judas was missing, but there was another disciple that was missing, and that was old doubting Thomas. They had went and told old Thomas, and Thomas said, unless I touch him, I'm not going to believe. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 24. The Bible says, but Thomas, one of the 12, called Didymus. Didymus means a twin. In other words, Thomas had a twin. I believe he had a bunch of twins when I think about that's in the churches today. There's a lot of doubting Thomases. <laughs> but the Bible goes on to say in verse 25, that the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of his nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, he didn't say, I cannot. But he said, I will not. That's the will of the heart. I will not believe. 
What Thomas had was not a problem of, of his mind, but he had a problem of his heart. And the Bible said, he said, unless I put my hands in those wounds, I will not believe it. I will not believe it. Heard about an atheist one time, says, I don't believe. And the preacher says, well, yes, you do believe. And the atheist says, I do not believe. He says, everybody believes. And the atheist said, I do not believe. He said, you believe that you do not believe. Everybody believes. So, my friend, you're confronted with a, a situation today. Will you believe? Or will you, with a hard heart, say like old Thomas, I will not believe. And then notice what happens. The Bible says in verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were with him and Thomas with them. And then came Jesus, the door being shut, stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And then he said to Thomas, I think the reason Jesus came that day was directly for Thomas. He said to Thomas, Reach hither thy fin." finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hands and thrust it into my side and is it not faithless but believing <laughs> can you imagine I'd love to have been there there's old Thomas I think he was hesitant he was doing like this but he touched his hands. He touched his brow. He put his hand in his side. And then you know what old Thomas said? My Lord, my God, my Lord, my God. Yes, it's you. And no one could convince Thomas any different from that day point on. Oh, friend. The Bible says in verse 29, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know who Jesus was talking about? He's talking about you and me. I haven't seen like Thomas saw Jesus, but I believe. I believe Jesus had the wounds. I believe Jesus died upon the cross. I believe Jesus was buried in the grave. I believe I'm willing to stake my eternal soul on that fact. Amen. I believe even though I have not seen. And you have too. If you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible tells us that he believed. I heard Chuck Swindoll one time talking about this young law, law student. And he was writing his dissertation. And he decided this law student was lost and he did not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He especially did not believe in the resurrection. But he decided he'd write his dissertation on the resurrection. Book after book, page after page, scripture after scripture, This young, educated young man 
intellect came to a point until all of a sudden there in that library where he was set, he threw up his hands and says, Lord, I believe. I trust you as my say. All the evidence, all the evidence is, is far passes that we could ever possibly imagine because of the wounds, the wounds. But one last thing I want you to see in closing is the scriptural that was eternal. See, it gives us a message, a message that we proclaim over and over and over and over again because it's an eternal message. Luke chapter 24, verse 50, Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven. And it says in verse 50, out on the Mount of Olives, he lifted up his hands and he blessed them and he was carried up into heaven. I can almost imagine as Revelation chapter 5 talks about when Jesus gets back, when he got back to heaven, all that transpired. God just sort of showed Jesus off in heaven. This is my son. Look at him. And the Bible reminds us in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, it says, And they held, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb that was slain. Now, I remind you, that it's John on the Isle of Patmos. God rolled back the heavens and he allowed John to get a glimpse of what was going on in heaven. How did John know that there was a lamb slain in heaven? Oh, friend. He could see the wounds. He could see the wounds that resurrected, glorified one. You know, the Bible talks about that when Jesus went back to heaven with the wounds, it kind of reminded me, like when I have gone to other countries, I would bring back mementos, souvenirs, as a reminder of what I experienced when I was there in that country. When Jesus went back to heaven, he took a, some mementos, some souvenirs. And there in heaven, he took back the wounds that this world gave to him. And I can imagine as Jesus walked through the gates of glory, strolled down the streets of glory and gold. I can imagine angels and Old Testament saints said, Oh, Jesus, it's so good to have you back here in heaven. It hasn't been the same. It's so good to have you back. And then they gazed upon his wounds with wonder and amazement of what he experienced. You say, how do you know that? Zechariah chapter 13 verse 6 says, what are the wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer to those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I can imagine the Bible says he sits upon the right hand of the Father making intercession for me. There's times that we all find ourselves failing the Lord Jesus Christ and not living up to the exact expectations of the Lord. And we sin. 
because of our sinful nature. And I can almost imagine that when that happens, the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself, goes rushing before the throne and says, Aha! There he is, a sinner. And the Bible says, Wages of sin is death. Put him to death. Then Jesus, sitting on the, upon the right hand of the Father, with those nail-pierced hands, reaches out and points to Satan, says, look, I've already paid the price. I already paid the price. But then... There's another aspect of it, this message of eternal worth. Wounds are sometimes like an ornament. <laughs> I remember when I was in high school, I uh, fractured my ankle playing football. Well, I was not ashamed of that ankle. I went to school on crutches and with a cast, proud to say, these are the elements of playing football. I believe Jesus did that as he approached the glories of heaven. He showed the ornaments, the elements of those wounds. But it's an eternal wonder. I don't know of everything that goes on in heaven, but I do believe this, that Jesus Christ, there sitting upon that throne, making intercession for us, he's there with the wounds in his hands, the wound in his side, the wounds upon his brow, the wounds upon his back, I believe with all my heart that's the way he looks. I heard about an old saint. She was in the hospital and she was dying. And there was a priest thought he would visit her. And he came and he took her by the hand and he said, Dear lady, I want you to know your sins have been forgiven. She says, Can I see your hands? You don't have nail prints in your hands. How can you forgive me? Only the one who has nail prints in his hands can forgive me and he has how about you sir how about you ma'am today are you willing to examine the wounds to let it like Thomas help you to come to the reality of believing and trusting and giving your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that you will.